Welcome to NTD China News, I'm Karen Chang. Making headlines this Wednesday, February 27th. Experts weigh in on how to respond to China's cyber threat. A decade in power, a look at Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao's mixed legacy. And Taiwan's legislators call for laws to ban illegal transplant tourism to China. Cybersecurity threats from Chinese hackers targeting U.S. companies has taken center stage after internet security firm Mandiant pointed to the Chinese military as being responsible. So in light of this and reports by U.S. firms of internet security breaches, experts weigh in on what companies can do to protect themselves. U.S. security experts worry Chinese hackers may plan more sophisticated attacks after a spate of hacking of U.S. companies traced back to China. Specifically, there are fears hackers could use information already stolen to launch fresh attacks. U.S.-based firms like Twitter, Facebook, NBC and Wall Street Journal have all reported security breaches of their computer systems. But we're now entering an environment where the world's largest economy will be a country that does not support rule of law, will be a country that is a principal threat in terms of cybersecurity, and will be a country where the most important economic actor is the state. And that means that American corporations that want to do business and compete in China will need to change the way they think. Ian Bremmer, the president of Eurasia Group, says U.S. companies would need to team up to boost their cybersecurity defenses. They're not going to pull out of China. They're going to share information. They're going to go to the trade association together, the U.S.-China Business Council, and they're going to raise this together. They're going to raise it with the U.S. government. An attack against one becomes an attack on all. Experts also expect more engagement with private cybersecurity firms. Risk Control Strategies is one such company. Paul Violas and his team specialize in preventing cyber attacks and hackers with smarter tactics. When you allow them in, it's way too late. It's almost like building, and uh, the best analogy I can give you, it's almost like building a, a home alarm system that only alarms when somebody's actually in your house. Well, okay, that's great, uh, but that's not helping me. We want, to, we, want to notify, we want to be notified when they're outside on the property. Here, same thing. So part of our responsibility is to embrace technology the same way and to make sure that we use the cyber world to our benefit. FBI Director Robert Mueller will address a conference later this week, briefing on the cyber threats and the need for more private cybersecurity firms to combat the growing risk of sophisticated cyber attacks. A report by German news magazine Der Spiegel says the European Aeronautic Defense and Space Company EADS and steel-making giant ThyssenKrupp have suffered major hacking attacks originating from China. EADS makes Eurofighter jet, spy satellites, drones and the Airbus and carrier rockets for French nuclear weapons. It says it came under major attack a few months ago. The attacks were considered serious enough to warrant a report to the German government. Hacking of the defense firm's blueprints and sensitive data could lead to major civilian and military disasters. Still making giant ThyssenKrupp also notified German authorities it had been subject to a quote massive attempt to attack its network administration in the U.S. from a Chinese internet address. Last month, security company Mandiant accused China's People's Liberation Army of more than 100 attacks on U.S. government agencies and major organizations. China's defense ministry has denied the allegations. Chinese President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Jiabao will officially step down in March. They've been in power for a decade, and their legacy has been left open to interpretation. Economic growth pushed China to be the world's number two economy. But that's come at the expense of rampant corruption, environmental damage, and growing social tension. For every percentage of growth, we may have to pay 10 percent of the cost or even more to make it right in the future. For example, we may have to spend 10 times or much more in the future to reverse environmental degradation caused by destructive development. And we will have to pay heavy prices for corruption, deepening disparity between the rich and poor, and widespread demoralization caused by the antagonism and hatred between ordinary people and the privileged. China's human rights and rule of law saw a turn for the worse over the past decade. When Hu Jintao inherited power from his predecessor Jiang Zemin, he inherited a persecution campaign against an estimated 70 to 100 million people. The brutal crackdown of the Falun Gong spiritual practice continued under Hu and Wen. Claims that detained adherents were being killed for their organs also surfaced during their term. 
In one of his final public speeches in 2012, Wen Jiabao appeared regretful over some of what happened over the past decade. 对于我在任职期间。I bear responsibility for the problems that have arisen in the economy and society during my term. During the upcoming congressional meeting set to begin on March 5th, Hu Jintao will hand over the presidency role to newly anointed Communist Party chief Xi Jinping. Wen's successor has not been made public, but is widely expected to be current Vice Premier Li Keqiang. Taiwanese legislators said on Wednesday that they will push for legislation to ban citizens from receiving transplants overseas with illegally sourced organs. It comes during a visit by a group of medical doctors and investigators to raise awareness of forced organ harvesting in China. We will address the matter of criminal responsibility in future organ transplants. We ask the health department to tell Taiwan's medical community that this is what we plan to do. Dr. Torsten Tri co-authored State Organs, Transplant Abuse in China. On Wednesday, he told Taiwanese legislators there is ample evidence that Chinese authorities are killing prisoners of conscience for their organs. Organs in China are not as officially explained only from executed prisoners, but from living prisoners of conscience, Falun Gong practitioners. So it's not about we provide evidence, it's about accepting evidence that we have. Even now, to these days, there are people who deny the Holocaust. It's not the evidence itself, but it's, it's, we have to, it's our responsibility to take the evidence that we have serious. There is evidence. According to Taiwan's Department of Health, almost 90 percent of local patients who underwent organ transplant overseas between 2011 went to China. Legislators Lin Shijia says Taiwanese citizens should be protected from being accomplices of illegal practices in China. I think through legislation, social dialogue will start. It will also push forward human rights in Taiwan and protect not only the rights in Taiwan but elsewhere too. Tri and other contributors to state organs are in Taiwan this week. They have met with Taiwan's medical and legal communities and will participate in a forum on transplant tourism on Thursday, an event organized by Taiwan's Department of Health. And still ahead on NTD China News, a Chinese judge calls himself a hooligan in a torture video. More than 100 scholars call on the Chinese regime to ratify the UN Rights Convention. And a flash mob in New York highlights suppression in Tibet. Shocking video of a jailed Beijing businessman has been leaked online. Xu Chongyang was sent to prison after exposing forced demolition in Beijing. Please be warned some of the images in this report are graphic. Wuhan businessman Xu Chongyang is a free man after being arrested in 2011 for speaking out about forced demolition. He was freed on January 5th and now a shocking video of his torture has surfaced. Chinese rights activist Hu Jia obtained footage. He published it on Boshun, an overseas news portal. In the video, shot between April and June 2011, Xu is stripped naked and hung up. His nose and mouth are bleeding, and a judge is cursing him loudly. His ribs are broken and his teeth knocked out. <laughs> This is just one of the multiple instances when Xu says he was tortured. Beijing police and the Wuhan judge were involved. Sometimes dozens of people were present. They record this, sometimes for filing, sometimes for watching it themselves, just for fun. Kind of a joy from sadism. This is a common practice among CCP thugs. No matter what position they have, policemen, security guards, judges, or staff for dismissing petitioners, they hide such videos very carefully because once exposed, they become evidence of crimes they committed. To obtain such videos is very, very difficult. 
In April 2011, Xu was detained for exposing forced demolition in the Zhongnanhai area in Beijing. After being tortured and disappearing into secret detention, he was formally arrested. Police accused him of masterminding the so-called Chinese Jasmine Revolution and being a, quote, U.S. spy. That's why he was tortured into giving a confession. Xu says during his 18-month prison term, Beijing police used psychedelic drugs on him, causing his hair to fall out and skin ulcers to form. They locked his feet with chains and handcuffed his hands, continuing to torture him. He still cannot dress himself and has difficulty breathing. Activist Hu Jia says he wanted to release the video to document the extent of torture and abuse that happens under China's law enforcement authorities. An official's son charged with gang rape, and now Beijing police have been forced to deny rumors that he was given special treatment. Rumors are swirling online that Li Tianyi, 17-year-old son of high-ranking general Li Shuangjiang, has been released on bail after being arrested for gang rape. Other accounts on various Chinese microblogs say that the victim has even withdrawn the charges, but that shouldn't be possible. As we've learned so far, if he is charged for involvement in a gang rape, it's unlikely he would be released on bail since rape is a felony. Beijing police denied Li has been released on bail on Tuesday, according to local media reports. They say the criminal investigation is also ongoing. Still, the case has stirred up debate over the preferential treatment given to officials and their family members. A lot of relevant information has appeared on the Internet. I noticed the earliest one was saying that a police insider had disagreed with how the case was handled, so he disclosed the information to the media. It seems that some people want to uncover the inside story. Ding Lifeng, former deputy editor of PR magazine, which is sponsored by China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said on his microblog that a reliable source have revealed that Li's family lawyers are trying to get the hotel staff where the crime happened to change their testimony. They are also reportedly offering compensation to the victim's family to settle out of court. This is not the first time Li Tianyi has been in trouble with the law. In 2011, he spent a year in a re-education center for attacking a couple after a car accident he caused. An open letter calling for better protection of civil rights was released to the public on Tuesday. More than 120 intellectuals, activists and journalists signed it, asking China's Congress to ratify the ICCPR. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was signed by China in 1998, but was never ratified by Congress. The UN Treaty holds signatory countries accountable for maintaining basic civil and political rights. Most of these rights are already enshrined in the Chinese constitution, but are not widely adhered to. The letter posted on the internet comes days before the annual session of the National People's Congress. During these meetings, Xi Jinping is set to take over as China's president. This letter is reminiscent of Charter 08, a widely circulated petition in 2008. It was signed by over 350 Chinese activists, many of whom face retributions afterwards. Canadian ambassador to China Guy Saint-Jacques has been denied permission to travel to Tibet. Just a few months into his post, he was told he would not be allowed to access the troubled region. As Tibetan self immolations continue to mount, Chinese surveillance of the area has intensified, as well as travel restrictions. Earlier this month, Australian ambassador was also denied access. The Australian foreign minister told the Senate he had tried to get permission for almost a year. To date, over 100 Tibetans have self-immolated in protest of the Chinese regime's oppressive policies in the region. The wave of Tibetan self-immolation protests began four years ago today. And to commemorate that day, students for a free Tibet organized a flash mob in the heart of New York City. It is better for everyone involved if the Chinese government recognizes the power of the self-immolations and tries to address the root causes of Tibetan grievances. Despite the rain, Tibetans in New York came out to show the world what is happening in their homeland. They stood in the wet and cold with banners showing the faces of Tibetans who had taken their lives. Each one announced the names and age of a self-immolator. After each name had been read, they sang the national anthem. 
And that's all we have time for for today's NTD China News. For more about China-related topics, visit our website at ntd.tv or subscribe to our YouTube channel NTD on China. Coming up next is a segment of the nine commentaries of the Communist Party. Stay tuned.